The crazy wasn't sleeping in his usual spot this morning. On her way out, she saw him leaning against the fry shop window, shirt off, talking to himself. For a split second, their glances met, and she felt a twinge of guilty fear. What if he was a watcher? But he looked away and drooled, and she promptly forgot about him as she entered the pedestrian traffic in the hallway. She took for granted the dimly lit halls and corridors, concrete tunnels fetid with the scents of unwashed bodies. Morning breaths, stale food odors, clogged drains, and ventilators blocked with refuse. This was normal for her. She had never known anything else. Morning traffic was heavy with first shift workers going to work, third shifters coming home, and students en route to class. Delivery push carts blocked half the halls and crowded the corridors and ramps. The delivery people tended to get nasty when someone was in their way. Deliveries were supposed to be made at night, but somehow never were. The corridors were five times wider than the halls, but worse to travel because of interlevel traffic, especially around the ramps. People were often knocked down and stepped on in the crush when traffic lights changed. When that happened, sirens and guard whistles shrilled through the crowd roar. In the enclosed spaces, all sounds echoed and were magnified over and over. Amy had learned to walk as fast as traffic allowed, dodging and weaving to avoid all contact with strangers. People were awed in the anonymity of the crowds. Some hit and some caressed, and she was not sure which kind of touch was more frightening. Shut into the whispering protection of her ear guards, she slipped through the mob with the swiftness of a wild thing, adept at eluding any kind of capture. Her walk to the learning center took her 25 minutes. Axel wasn't in class when she got there. He was often late, so she didn't start to worry until after the opening isometric session. The crazy isn't here, Anita pointed at Axel's empty terminal. He's not crazy, Amy said as she wiped her forehead. It was very warm exercising in two suits of clothing. He's not normal. Maybe he's sick, a boy named Alan said. How could they tell? Anita laughed, but no one else did. The older girl's eyes narrowed and she looked more closely at Amy. You're getting fat. Look at you. Is that why you get out of training dorm? Because your mother steals extra rations for you? She doesn't, Amy blushed. First with anger at Anita, and then with self-consciousness as the other students stared at her. With two sets of clothes on and her pockets stuffed full, maybe she did look odd. But nobody had noticed until now. Why don't you mind your own business, Anita? The truth hurts, the other girl taunted. Amy turned her back and sat down. Giving Anita a good kick would be very satisfying, but it would also start a fight. Anita outweighed her by 30 pounds, and Amy was not stupid. Nor did she want to attract the camera's attention to herself this morning. She just wanted to get out of here. She could go up to level 12 and try to find Axel. But if he had already left the shelter and was on his way here, she'd never see him in the crowds. And if he was sick, she didn't want to go home again without even trying to get outside. But she didn't want to go without him. The buzzer rasped for class. Talking ceased. Amy's first tape was called City Living and was a retarded form of citizenship. She had been given the same course for three years now. It's scheduling part of the Watcher's system to dull her mind as much as possible. Hallway traffic flows fine if we all keep in single file, the worn tape chanted. Traffic never gets too tight if we all keep to the right, and we will have a better day if we give sirens right away. No rhyme had been found for don't shove on ramps or wasting water kills us all. While her screen showed a series of warning symbols, the voice track explained the meaning of these road signs for the illiterate. Don't run was a picture of a boy with broken legs. Amy pretended to watch by staring at the top rim of her screen. Next to her, Anita's screen was showing the simplified steps of assembling thong sandals as part of a girl's career training. To the left, Anne was learning how to repair the ceiling unit of a pipe extruder. Amy had seen both those tapes so often she knew them by heart. Sometimes, if she allowed herself to think about how bored she was, a feeling of deep tiredness would come over her. Her body would seem to weigh a thousand pounds, her stomach would start to churn, 
and she would have to get up and go to the sand to keep from fainting or throwing up. So she had learned not to think about it, but instead try to remember a story in the book and flash it on the screen within her mind. This might be the last time she ever sat here like this. She knew she should feel bad about that, but she didn't. Her mother still talked about how bad she felt when she had to leave her learning center for training dorm. Amy wondered why. It wouldn't matter to her if she never saw Anita again, or Anne, who had once been her best friend until Anita warned her that Amy was a reader. Anne didn't even know what reader meant, but she had quit talking to Amy. Or Alan, who was very bright, but pretended to be a normal, and passed hours playing by himself until the watcher had him fixed. Or Agnes, who never spoke, just smiled sometimes. At mid-break, when all the others went to get their lunch from the dispensers, Amy went to find Axel. There was much less traffic now. Some places one could see all the way across the corridor and, at intersections, down the halls. Greasy fluid had been spilled on the up-ramp to level 10. Maintenance workers were spreading lint to absorb the slippery oil. Amy waited at the edge of the crowd until the ramp was clear, then let the crowd precede her so she could take her time. She liked walking ramps. They curved, and she found curves pleasing in a world where everything ran in straight lines. For safety reasons, the ramps were well lit and kept fairly clean, and, when they opened out onto a level, gave the only feeling of spaciousness that she knew. There was no need to ask directions. The youth shelters were in the same block on every level, at B and 7 down. At the shelter, two guards sat on stools just inside the sliding glass doors. They were talking to each other, and while one looked up and saw her waiting, he ignored her. She waved, then pressed her nose against the glass, looking lost and scared. After a good five minutes, one of the men bestirred himself enough to rise and open the door a crack, but he neither spoke nor looked directly at her. Thank you, she said, suspecting that if she let her anger show, he'd slam the door as if she didn't exist. Adults did that to kids, or anyone smaller than themselves. I've come to get Axel, 32281. He's a transfer in my class on 9, and he didn't show up. Is he sick? The man gave no indication of hearing her, then said, Watcher want him? What do you think? Her question wasn't a lie. Another little pause, and then the man turned to the terminal next to their stools. What's the number? Axel, 32281. He repeated the number to the terminal speaker. Axel 32281 is in-house, the computer immediately answered, its voice markedly polite compared to the humans. He ain't gone out, kid, the guard said. Is he sick? How should I know? Well, can I go see him? The guard looked at his cohort. She wants to see a kid here. The other guard shrugged. Why not? No skin off my neck. Let her in. She slipped through the open crack in the door. Where? Monk has his number on it, the second guard nodded at a passage behind him. Down there. She had not imagined that there were so many homeless children and suddenly knew she was fortunate by comparison. The shelter was a maze of passages. Above the entrance to each were numbers starting with 100, 00, zero to 200 and continuing as far as one could see in the distance. Inside each numbered dormitory, Row on row of three-tiered bunks filled the space from floor to ceiling. Walls, floors, bunks, and blankets were all pale green and grimy with use and age. The place smelled of urine and despair, all masked with disinfectant. Amy stood at the door to the 300 room, not wanting to enter. The place was almost empty. Only a few bunks were occupied, one by a small boy who lay whimpering and thrashing restlessly. Across from him, an older boy lay watching the child, his face impassive. Two girls came running down the aisle and brushed past her out the door. She guessed they were late for class. There was no way to avoid it. She went in. The bunk with Axel's number appeared to have been made with him in it. A ragged green blanket covered the mattress from head to foot. Axel was the fetal-shaped lump beneath the blanket. After calling his name and getting no answer, she gingerly lifted the blanket from the bulge she thought was his head. He peered up at her, his expression changing from fear at not knowing who his visitor was to a frown of surprise. 
There were circles and puffs around his eyes as if he had been crying a long time. You sick? He shook his head. Why aren't you in class? He shrugged. She reached over and felt his forehead. He had no fever, but he flinched away from her touch. Let me alone. Get out of here. She pulled her hand back and held it as if she had been burned. If you weren't sick, why are you acting like this? She asked. I thought you said we were going to start looking today. I got all ready to go. He put on his new ear guards and pulled the blanket over his head again, shutting her out, and started to rock. She watched for a moment, feeling disappointed and sorry for herself because no one seemed to want her around, even this boy who had nothing else. And then she considered him. Okay, she said, and yanked the blanket off him, and pushed up his ear guard so he could hear her. You can stay here forever if that's what you want, and if this is how you're going to live, crying and sleeping all the time, it won't make much difference to you when you die, but I'm going. Goodbye, Axel. She was halfway down the aisle when she heard him yell, That's not my real name! The boy minding the sick child looked around at the shout. She stopped and turned but could not see Axel for bunks. She walked back, slowly, not eager for more rejection. He had rolled into his stomach and was peering through the dimness. That's not my real name, he said again when he caught sight of her. It will be so long as you're here, she stood by the end of his bunk. He stared at her with his puffy eyes. Are you really going to try? She nodded. Now? Today? She nodded again. What if you can't find a way out? What if people try to catch you? What if... His fears rolled him over on his back and made his legs writhe. I did try, you know. And if I fail again, then I'm trapped here for always. His whisper subsided into a whimper. Yes, she agreed. So am I. But you're used to it. You don't know anything better. Amy frowned. There was something wrong with his logic where she was concerned, but she was in no mood to analyze that now. Are you coming or not? You're going now? I already wasted half a day because of you. She waited for his response. When he continued to stare at her, she took a deep breath and turned to go. Wait! I'm coming. A buzzer signaled the end of lunch break. Cameras scanned the aisles as the children straggled back to the solitary confinement of their terminals. The watcher's mouth twitched in irritation as he noted two empty seats. Now the girl was absent as well as the boy. Was that coincidence? Profile Axel 32281, he told the computer. The boy's file was brief. The first entry, made less than a year before, was a level 4 medic's report. Unidentified pre-adolescent male patient admitted in comatose conditions suffering from concussion, severe lacerations, contusions, abrasions, and four broken ribs. Severely depressed. No print ID on file. Assumed illegal birth and service levels. The file noted the assignment of a temporary ID and the subject's transfer to the shelter on 12 in the learning center. The watcher dialed the level 12 shelter on a routine check and was told Axel 32281 had left the area, with the girl you sent to get him. The security film was replayed, and as Amy's face appeared, the watcher felt a warning twinge of unease. Their joint absence was not coincidental. Two abnormals were truant together. Why? Because the watcher had higher ambitions within the select world of authority, he was more thorough and resourceful than most of his ilk. He noted the ID number of the medic who had first treated 32281 and called him. The medic remembered the patient only vaguely. Very disturbed, traumatized by some sort of sexual assault, his reality parameter was shaken. In what way? He believed he lived outside. When? Before he was admitted. Had he? The medic's face closed. The question was close to treason. I want to know, the watcher insisted. Was he physically different in any way? Any evidence of solar radiation? The patient was psychotic, the medic insisted. It's in the record. You never considered he was telling the truth. Don't be... The patient was disturbed. 
The medic's indignant face disappeared as the watcher flipped to another channel. Perhaps, the watcher thought, I'm overreacting to a case of simple truancy. Still, it would be smart to alert the hall monitors.